Hello and welcome to Sport Unlocked episode 100. Thank you everyone for listening and subscribing over the last couple of years to myself, Rob Harris from Sky News, Martin Ziegler from The Times and Tarek Panja from The New York Times. So a landmark episode and a landmark moment in sports business with bidding for Manchester United heating up. This is where we begin this week's pod. Later, we'll have details of the UEFA review into the Champions League final chaos. But as for Manchester United, we've got Sir Jim Radcliffe, the bid that we knew about from January. An offer was submitted. We don't know for what value from Ineos. And then the other known rival is the Qatari bid from Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani, the chairman of the Qatar Islamic Bank. So what do we make of these bids? In a straight fight between the Qataris and Jim Ratcliffe, yeah, he's a billionaire, but he's not a country. I can't see how he'd be able to match what would be a massive price to acquire the team and then spend a ton more money immediately to build the infrastructure that the club needs the the rebuild or revamp of old trafford the the training facilities etc so you kind of imagine now we're going to have a hearts and minds exercise from jim ratcliffe and his people local boy made good coming back to manchester with manchester at the heart of the club uh, of the of the club um and differentiate itself from Manchester United, this important cultural asset, not only to Manchester, but Britain, being sold off to a sovereign state for whatever goals that those countries have in mind. Interesting to see how how much that is, how much they both are, and if there's anything like the, the five billion that the uh, Glazers say that they want. Um, people say that's, that, some people say that's far too much. Other people think it, it's actually worthwhile. We will see. Now, Sheikh Jassim says the bid will be launched through the 9-2 Foundation, something that doesn't knowingly exist yet. We're told his private wealth will fund this bid. Incidentally, the 9-2 Foundation clearly nod to the class of 92. But so many have got the question, how linked will this bid be to the Qatari state, particularly as we think about Paris Saint-Germain's ownership. I know that those close to Sheikh Jassim bin Hamed Al Thani are saying there's clear divisions between him and the Qatar Investment Authority, but there are obvious links. I mean, the, the QIA are the the biggest investors in the in the QIB bank that he's the chairman of. So I think there are challenges here for the football authorities to try and. Um, make a distinction between whether this actually is a private investor, what connections there are to the Qatar state, um, because these are important things. There's Paris Saint-Germain owned by the Qatar Sports Investments. Is, is this all part of the, the same ruling family? I think I think there are quite big challenges. You know, if you have PSG playing against Manchester United, and if this deal goes through, are you then seeing, you know, the one side of the Qatar government play and another side of the Qatar ruling state? UEFA do seem fine with the way the Red Bull clubs can face each other from Leipzig and Salzburg. So does it seem that UEFA would probably just find this acceptable, that they would be separate from PSG? Personally, I don't think that there'll be any real difficulty in convincing the authorities, particularly UEFA, of a separation between PSG and Man United, despite it being pretty obvious that a tiny country like Qatar and the purchase of something as enormous, certainly from a public relations point of view, as Manchester United can't be sanctioned without the nod from the state, without some state investment or involvement. The um, the fact that Nasser al Khalifi who is the f- former tennis partner or even maybe the current tennis partner of the Emir of Qatar is the president of PSG, but he's also sits on the board of UEFA, is pretty close to the UEFA president, um, Alexander Sheferin, is, 
is something that we <laughs> must point out here uh, in terms of someone who could smooth out that process. Qatar really has an inside man here. And in being Media Group, which he also leads, is one of UEFA's biggest customers. I, I genuinely don't think that there's going to be an issue here in terms of getting UEFA to acquiesce to this. We've had other agreements with UEFA and teams with um, the same owner in the same competition, the two Red Bull teams, for example. Um, and of course, there'll be lawyers all over this. There's going to be a, a fudge or a way out. We only saw that with Newcastle in the Premier League not so long ago. Well, there's no indication how long this sale process could go on for, or indeed if the Glazers do choose to sell 100% of their ownership of Manchester United. Uh, only these two known bids at the time of recording. Well, we know some of our most loyal listeners throughout the 100 episodes have been at FIFA. And this week, we've had the FIFA accounts for 2022, showing just how successful things are financially, with almost $4 billion now in the reserves, in cash. And Gianni Fantino's done pretty well as well out of it with uh, his remuneration. Hi, Johnny. Hope, hope you're well. The uh, he's, uh, FIFA's annual accounts have come out, and um, it's been a good year for him on the personal front. Um, 1.95 million Swiss franc base salary, and then a, a bonus of 1.65 million Swiss francs. Um, so I think which is up about 650,000. So... Um, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good year for Mr. Infantino. Um, not quite the level of set blatter from his uh, his well secret bonuses he was paid for his World Cup cycles, which I think was around twelve million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, huge amount. And, and credit, I suppose, some credit to the new FIFA that we get to see all of these um, details at least a bit more transparently than than those days. And also, the revenue has gone up from the Blatter era as well. So, in Blatter's last World Cup cycle, 2011 to 2014, FIFA generated $5.7 million. And in this cycle, 2019 to 2022, revenue has gone up to $7.6 billion. And while being paid less than uh, Sepp Blatter. It's an interesting thing, I think, about... I was thinking about this about... FIFA, UEFA, national associations, is it necessarily a good thing that revenue increases so much? Because it, who's paying for that in the end? Yeah, yeah, that's re it's a really good point. Also, FIFA's under Gianni, he, there is this obsession to um, get these massive numbers and huge numbers, just keep increasing revenue. Like I say, keep going, keep going, increase revenue to this enormous amount. And Gianni's electioneering has been handing out higher and higher amounts to um, the National Football Federation. I think it's now almost at the level of 10 times in terms of grants to each FA. Someone, someone I spoke to said that means for the Caribbean island of Montserrat, the FIFA development money could work out at 10% of the entire island's income. So, um, and that speaks to the issue here, that FIFA's, FIFA's handouts aren't merit-based, aren't needs-based. Every football association gets exactly the same amount of money. And you have to wonder why that is. And the only answer is because there is a vote. For every member gets the same vote. So you've got to, you've got to hand this cash out. That doesn't seem a very different method of running FIFA than in the latter days, does it? And they are sort of accumulating all this cash for the FIFA forward programme. They say they're distributing billions in the next cycle from it. The key thing is the integrity checks and actually where this money is going, insurance going to the right projects. Are they handed out for developmental reasons, political reasons, in part as well to sort of shore up your base? Yeah, and absolutely. To be honest, it's not just FIFA as well. All the national FAs, um, sorry, the regional confederations, CONCACAF, UEFA, Comrable, etc., etc. They also have this system implanted in their own in their own confederations. I think, um, in fact, in Europe, some of the, I think the handouts might be of equivalent size, if not even bigger, at, at European level as well to the FA. So, and the same model, hat-trick programme, every, every member gets the same amount of money. It just seems that this is the football system 
that you can't really um, shake whatever happens. And this revenue is coming from broadcasters and sponsors. One sponsor that's been the focus quite a bit, Visit Saudi. And now FIFA is taking the Club World Cup to Saudi Arabia for the first time. The council meeting this week to decide to take this year's edition to a potential future Fuller World Cup host country. The interesting thing, there's no sort of bidding process as far as I can make out. Um, this was a, just a recommendation from the the, the FIFA executive to, to the FIFA council. Um, only one name put forward, Saudi Arabia. I know it's not the biggest thing, is it? It's still only 17, seven teams involved. Um, but even so, I can you know you, you can sort of see it all. Everything's coming slightly together um, because the host nation, their, their national champions play in it and the way things are looking, Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo's new team, Al Nasser, that they could be national champions. They've got Cristiano Ronaldo playing the Club World Cup. It all seems uh, all coming together quite uh, quite nicely for FIFA. One of the Saudis. things around the Qatar World Cup was making a play about these human rights checks that are now embedded in the bidding process. So we saw it for the 2026 World Cup for North America in their contest against Morocco. They produced these human rights risk assessments. But for the Club World Cup, no evidence at all of any such risk assessments public, any sort of assessments of the host. No, you're right, Rob. Um, and there isn't. And then FIFA seems to have planted a story in, in one of the British papers uh, the day after to announce they've hired a human rights official, a senior human rights official, the day after handing Saudi Arabia this the Club World Cup without... Um, without a bid or without any any um, rival competition. Uh, and that, that's what they did with China, if I remember as well. There was going to be the first expanded 24-team Club World Cup uh, was supposed to be held in China in 2021, but because of COVID, that got scrapped. That's now going to be a 32-team event. And we got some new information about that as well this week, that there's going to be... Um, 12 teams from Europe, for example, in this competition. Six from South America, four each from Africa, Asia, CONCACAF, one from Oceania and one from the tournament host. That's right. 25. But, but, but what, we, what we weren't told, and again, it looks like there won't be a bidding competition for this event as well. And this, to me, seems like it's a very significant event. A 32-team Club World Cup seems quite a big thing to host, something a few countries might want to, want to host. But again, this one looks like it's going to be um, in FIFA's gift to distribute to, to whoever it wants to. And again, probably, Martin, <laughs> maybe no human rights checks here either. Well, I think there's a suggestion it could be in the USA as a sort of warm-up. Would make sense. Um, which makes sense. I mean, it can't be in the... Because it's going to have to be in June and July. So um, I don't, there's no way it can be in, in the Gulf. I don't, can it? Just like too hot. Um, I think that's already been that's finally been accepted by football that you can't play big tournaments uh, in the Gulf in June or July. So um, yeah, it'll have to be. I mean, it's going to be hot enough in the USA at that time. But um, I think that probably the most likely. Unless, can you think of any other possible options? So it's a way of FIFA taking on those big pre-season tours that normally take place in late July, the International Champions Cup, for instance, run by Charlie Sidetano. Here you are taking your big showpiece, first edition to the United States, right across all those ever-growing uh, soccer markets. Yeah, it's a good good potential warm-up idea, but let's remember Gianni's slogan he keeps using. He's there to make football truly global, and that's like this um, sort of kick towards Europe every time he says it. It's not just a European product. It's to take football around the world. Um, these tournaments are often held... Um, these summer tournaments, these teams like to go to Asia as well. Um, you know, we, we haven't had any major international sporting event in Asia for a very long time. Asia seems to, these days, only really be the Gulf. Well, attention moves to France now for two different reasons. One is actually the importance, perhaps, of assessing bids. But firstly, why Gianni Infantino was in Paris this week to see uh, Emmanuel Macron at the time of a sense of embattlement, of course, for the suspended, the self-suspended French Federation president, uh, Nola Gros. From what I understand, FIFA have been 
quite sort of bullish in trying to support Noel Le Gray. Um, I hear that they wanted UEFA to sign a, a letter of support saying there had been government interference in, in, in his position at head of the French FA. He's due to stand for FIFA, um, uh, for the, one of the UEFA places on FIFA in April. Um, I don't think he's got much chance if he if he even goes ahead. He was up against Fernando Gomez, who's uh, very much a sort of favoured person of, of the UEFA leadership. Um but it's, it's a, you know when you think some of the allegations against Noel Gray, a bit strange that he's getting such support. Mm. But yeah, well, the, the world of football. There was a letter. There was a letter sent by um, from FIFA, signed by the general secretary uh, before Infantino's visit to Macron, signed by Fatma Samoura, reminding the French of FIFA's rules on government interference in football. Um, and again, that could be seen as that sign of support for uh, Legrette, that you don't decide what happens in football, um, we, we do. Uh, I'm not sure the French, uh, given where this investigation into Legrette is and, and the, the, the kind of you know daily media coverage in France on this issue, will really pay much mind to that. Um, you can't really see him surviving this, can you? Well, as we were talking about, a Club World Cup going to a country without any open bidding process, without any sort of full, obvious assessments of the suitability. We bring our attention now to the Champions League final fallout from 2022 with UEFA's panel delivering their report this week. The chaos that unfolded outside, the logistical problems, the dangerous policing at times that led to a near disaster and Liverpool fans could have potentially died, the report highlights, given what went wrong in the overall planning for this event. There was no venue risk assessment at the Stade de France. They based the plans on models for different tournaments and perhaps suggestions in the review that they didn't learn or take into account issues using the Stade de France in the past, of course, this was a Champions League final that was meant to be in St. Petersburg. It was removed from there due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then decision was taken between the UEFA leadership, Alexander Sheffrin, and the French president, Emmanuel Macron, in a very quick notice to decide to give the event to Paris. And what we see in the report really is perhaps a sense of complacency and overlooking concerns, not only in the build-up, but also on the night from particularly members of that UA for events division. Yeah, I think it's a sort of wake-up call for, for all sort of organisers of the matches. But, I mean, part of me thought the, the report let the French police off the hook. I mean, you guys were both there, so you, you can probably speak um, m- more... Um, knowledgeably about it than me but it's you know watching from afar um and the the reaction the french police um and that you know the whole security operation which i guess was it was a sort of french uh operation is they they seem to sort of come out of this very lightly um but be interesting to see what you think yeah i i was there watching some of this it was horrific um the treatment that this kind of indiscriminate use of tear gas young children, um, babies even with their parents, um, disabled fans, and also just, it was just wild and chaotic um, from the police. Um, And I I don't think, as you pointed out there, the report really, um, you know, in in my opinion, based just on what I saw, um, really drilled down upon that that role of, of, of the police in that way. It did um, um, single out UEFA, perhaps quite rightly as well, if it completely abdicated its responsibility for this oversight. But what were they supposed to oversee would have been this security operation. The way the police handled it, Rob, was was pretty scary at times, wasn't it? It was, and we both encountered it, walking from the train station in the route talked about in the report to the stadium, we witnessed several key things that later emerged in the report, things that we just thought at the time were just inconveniences, perhaps. There was uh, bad route planning. We didn't know which way to go. Lack of sort of stewarding staff outside to point us in the right way. 
Then we got to one entrance point and it looked like being the right one. And we were having to show something that indicated we were media to collect our pass inside. We got right to the front of this and then realized we were told it's the wrong entrance to be. And we had to find our way out. And actually that's something in the report talking about one of the entry points on the perimeter of the stadium, having too few lanes and no exit point if someone's ticket didn't work and we had to sort of push our way to get back out again, then you get issues with the bottlenecks and police not necessarily dealing fully with the local use and then firing tear gas indiscriminately, closing the entrances and then Liverpool fans getting frustrated while actually seeming quite patient. It was a no split at the time. And they were the ones shouting at the local use to get down from climbing on the fence. But certainly pepper spray use, tear gas was pretty provocative at times and also it was creating problems for asthmatic fans which it does confuse the overall confusion when it says prime responsibility was with UEFA as the overall event host while also saying there was shared responsibility with the police and French FA and tournament and stadium organisers when obviously UEFA can't tell the police what to do it, what the report seems to draw out is actually perhaps UEFA didn't do enough to check on those security plans for the night. Well, yeah, why have a security arm within UEFA if it's not doing anything? That that clearly was pointed out there. That's a really good point. And the other the other thing that we can finally put to rest, which was obvious at the time, that there was that announcement in the stadium, if you remember, that the game had been delayed due to the late arrival of football supporters. And this was a UEFA statement that was put on the big screens and then broadcast around the world um, on television as well, which was completely false. Um, that, again, was 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 highlighted and, and, and put to bed. See, guys, the, so we then had this report coming out and there is an apology from, from, from UEFA, but it was a, an apology from the General Secretary. Um, and what, what that report described was a near miss and that meant um, there could have been a serious risk of ma mass fatalities at that event. It just seems like such a big deal. We haven't had any words from the UEFA president at all, whether in, in a written statement that was signed by the General Secretary in the aftermath or in any media appearances. Do, do you think he, he should speak about this? I, I don't know. I, in, my, in my mind, I think there should be some words from the UEFA president. I think you know the, the the language used in the report, you know, near disaster. You know, it was sort of remarkable. Nobody lost their lives. It echoes of you know the, what happened before the the Hillsborough disaster in nineteen eighty nine. Um, so yeah, no, it should be addressed at the very top level. Uh, absolutely, it should be. And yeah, but I'm just going back to saying it should be a wake up call. I do think that it, when you have like three organisations involved in something, so you got UEFA, for the French police, and and um, the French Federation. I, I wonder if just you know, there's a sort of you know shifting of responsibility. But I think it has to be said that you know it has to it has to be UEFA's ultimate responsibility because it's uh, it's their final. Yeah, uh, it's not the first UEFA. It's almost three finals in a row, right? So we had this again near miss in London at Wembley at the Euro 2020 final. We then had um, I was contacted by by someone this week. Um, it was at the Europa League final in Seville where there were serious issues. It was baking hot, remember, and there was no water and there was potential chaos there. Major events. And th there is one commonality here. These are UEFA finals, these these three in Europe at least. Um, and and the other thing with the report, it said it marginalised the, the, the head of security, it seemed. This is, and this is a chap that is, I guess in a sense, umbilically connected to, to the UEFA president, given, you know, it's someone from Slovenia, a very close friend. Yeah, one thing that was notable is perhaps you might have seen some sort of new structure announced this week or some sort of moving and shifting of people around or sort of the impression that you've, you've responded by creating sort of new checks in place. But something, you know, obviously UEFA commissioned this report themselves, they're probably feeling now actually the sort of the pushback from it has, has led to sort of deeper consequences, but there would have been growing calls if they hadn't produced this report. But it also makes you think about the African Cup of Nations in 2022. We had eight dead in the crush 
outside the stadium in Hyundai and whether it's less media pressure, less local pressure, no obvious sign of sort of big local investigations, no CAF investigation into that, what was a, a deadly incident. And joining us now is one of those people who helped to author this UEFA report, the Executive Director of Football Supporters Europe, Ronan Evan. Welcome to Sport and Lot. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So we were just reflecting on the report and why perhaps the police, local authorities get less blamed than UEFA when obviously they were in charge of the overall sort of policing that nearly created the the deadly crush. I don't know. I think that depends how you read it. As a, as a French person myself, I, I find it pretty damning for the for the French authorities. What is um, probably the worst part for them is that uh, first, uh, everything that happened on the Stade de France happened before, to, to a certain degree, at football games, at UEFA events, but also at concerts and, and whatnot. And the other the the other matter is that. Uh, is that uh, the, the prefecture, the police, and the French authorities have, have uh, shown that they were completely unable to work with other stakeholders, whether it was the transport company, uh, the FFA, if you were fine, and whatnot. So, um, no, from a French perspective, it's pretty damning. Uh, that shows the incapacity of the French public authorities to organize a football event, and that uh, brings some serious questions about the Rugby World Cup and, uh, and the Olympics in 2024. Ronan, you, you were part of this panel writing the report. How was that process? Did you think it was smooth? Um, can you describe what the, the months-long investigation was like? UEFA had said it would be three months. It took seven months in the end, so presumably it was quite thorough. Yeah, the fact that it took longer, I would take it as a good sign. Uh, the, the the three months is four months is uh, timeline was 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 never agreed by the panel and was uh, d- didn't reflect any 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 proper uh, timeline. So the fact that it took us longer, um, yeah, again, I would take it as a as a positive. Um, the panel itself, um, well. I think it's a bit like if the, the two, there's probably two ways to do this. And you have followed, I think, the blueprint of uh, the Baroness Casey uh, panel um, in in uh, in the UK. So appointing a public figure to run an inquiry. I'm I'm not sure in the end that was the best uh, the best option. Maybe there should have been um, a company specialized in this, brought in or something like this. But. Um, the work done, especially uh, by some of our colleagues who brought the methodology uh, to this, I'm, I'm thinking about Pete Weatherby or, or Cliff Stott, who has who have experience in this sort of work, led to uh, to, to the result that we know today, which uh, we are um, extreme, extremely proud of. I know there's a huge number of recommendations, but if there's one really overarching finding, but there's something they need to change, what, what do you think that is? Uh, probably the source of all... F- evils is how the competitions are, are being attributed and how the countries are selected. Um, we know that not every country in the UFR region is capable of hosting uh, a competition like this and the size of the stadium is not the only criteria. So I think this is uh, about having um, more ambitious bidding requirements and also being able to, to, to follow through. If you, if you look at France, that's a good example. You, in the Euro 2016 that France applied for, uh, agreed to host, uh, and agreed to a certain set of criteria, and then all the way through to the first uh, day of the competition, try to get rid of a number of committees. And that, that, that's a pattern we've seen in, in every competition. So I think that, yeah, the bidding requirements have to be stronger, and they have to be implemented in a much, much uh, more thorough manner. And then, um, yeah, the, the finals from last year, uh, they've told us that, uh, that, that UFA needs to put more effort in, uh, in the service side of things. Uh, this, the, it's, not, it's not only about you know, creating a, a safe and secure environment, it's also about not treating people like animals. And I have to say, we, we're already make, making progress in that regard in the preparation of this year's final. Um, some of them are complicated, but uh, we, we are relatively optimistic that things will, will go better. What we see from the report is clearly a, a sense of complacency in the build-up and also a warning that actually there'd been issues with the Stade de France in the past. What was the most shocking thing you uncovered 
when going through all the documents, when you had these interviews with UEFA, you've got all the transcripts of everything. What shocked you most about perhaps the night or the build-up and preparation to the event? In the build-up, there's the filling. And again, that has to do with the French authorities. That it was, it was, a, it was a catastrophe about to happen. It was a, a train about to crash and no one could do anything about it. That, 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 that was extremely frustrating. Because again, what happened on, in the Stade de France, well, the combination, the domino effect was, was something we hadn't seen before. But what led to, what led to it, the problems that, that are as, as old as the stadium. So when it comes to the most shocking, well, it's probably the confirmation that uh, this was a near miss, that people could, could have died. Uh, I was there myself. I had the perception that we, that, uh, that we were very close to, to, to deadly catastrophe, but the work done over seven months has confirmed that impression. In, in the report, though, there was, I noticed, and um, there were people flagging up to some of us as well, these, these two dissenting voices at the, the, the end, these two Portuguese um, guys, they didn't want to sign off on this report. They said that's not their opinion. Can you tell us how they came to be involved and they weren't on the panel it looks like i don't see them listed as one of the the this is it seven panelists why, why do these two get this um dissenting opinion or what did they dissent to uh honestly i i have no idea how, they, how we got to this point um they were appointed as administrative support to the chair of the panel uh supposedly to bring an additional experience in uh in uh, major sporting events and football operations to uh, to the panel, ultimately they ended up being um, panel members, and I think that's down to the to the chair of the panel how how we got we got there. So maybe that's a question for him. Although uh, my understanding is that he doesn't take uh, media request. Um, I don't think their dissenting opinion reflects uh, any sort of. Um, sort of work on the matter or an actual dissenting opinion. I think it's. Uh, I think it reflects uh, their uh, commercial interest and potential conflict of interest. I think that's what it is. You, you mean they work in football? Is that what do you mean? The conflict of interest? Yeah, they, 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 they yeah they work in football, and um, the fact that they didn't want to uh, put the primary responsibility on UEFA was their decision. It was against the rest of the panel. The way we worked was uh, based on consensus. So normally, from the moment, uh, a majority of panel members uh, agreed on the final draft. That should have, uh, shouldn't have been a problem. They decided for their own, again, for their own personal interest to add this addendum, uh, while, while not even being members of the panel. It's, uh, it's a shame. It, I, I, was, uh, I was strongly against it, like a number of other members of the panel. But then that shows... Probably that's where the the, the lack of uh, the lack of, uh, of structure, of a clear structure around the and around the review comes into play, and uh, and uh, that's where that's where you, that that's where it's it's pretty obvious. I don't think it's uh, it reflects the the opinion of the rest of the of the panel. The the, the, the report is fairly critical by name um, of Martin Callan, the the head of UEFA Events SA, the the, the events company which is run by UEFA. Um, He's been around a long time, done a lot of major tournaments, um, both in his sort of interview with with the panel and and the sort of comments about him. um, Do you think his position is sort of tenable? I think it's for UEFA to decide. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the one to, to call for people to, to leave their position or to be, uh, to be fired. Um, yes, his name is, uh, is mentioned uh, several times in, in, the, in the report because he's, uh, he's UEFA uh, event top, top management. But beyond this, I I'm, I'm, I'm wouldn't be able to, 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 to answer that question. I mean, I suppose what you're looking for is a sense of perhaps key action points of what might have changed at UEFA as a result of this. Yeah, well, what will change in uh, in uh, in the preparation of and the, and the run up of the events? And uh, well, we are at the point when we received a number of commitments from UEFA uh, about the implementation of um, of supporters related recommendations. Um, but the report was only published uh, at the beginning of this week, so uh, the, the, the the any further discussion on on this implementation hasn't happened yet. But we are at the moment of the of the year when we when we visit venues for the uh, for, for the for this year's finals. My colleagues were in Budapest yesterday, and um, again we see 
progress, we see that uh, our input is better taken into consideration. So uh, we can be uh, realistically optimistic. One thing in the report is how dangerous the use of tear gas and pepper spray was and could have been even more serious. Clearly, UEFA probably can't order the police to stop firing tear gas and pepper spray, just like they couldn't at Euro 2016, or that was sort of more in the streets. How can this change in future? I mean, should UEFA not take an event to a country where the police routinely use tear gas and pepper spray, or do they try and get somehow assurances it won't be used? Well, it's certainly part of the equation. Uh, that's a problem in France in general. It's a problem at protests. It's a problem at, at any big events in France. And if you, if you, well, in, it's pretty clear in the report that for someone coming from Spain or England, that's relatively unusual and that that causes major distress. Um, what the UEFA can do there is to use its um, soft power to put pressure on the on on, on the host country. UEFA is promoting. Uh, the, the Council of Europe Convention on safety, and s- uh, safety, Security and Services at major sporting events. That's a key tool. So, yeah, not taking events to countries that uh, don't uh, that are not able to police an, uh, a game like this properly is is uh, is uh, is the key. And um, and for UEFA to certainly use more of his of its uh, soft power on on host countries. This report obviously said the UEFA had prime primary responsibility for what happened, um, which is, what does that mean in, in the context? Because the, these finals, are, we've all been to these, you arrive in a country, you are in the city, and then you go to the stadium. And often when you're in the city, like, you know, we're in Istanbul, for example, uh, we'll host a Champions League final. Fans will mill around Taksim Square uh, for most of the day. Um None of that's got anything to do with UEFA, though, right? So where, where does UEFA's responsibility start? Is it as soon as these fans land in the country and they're in, um, in, in the city? Because that's very hard to, to kind of see for, for someone like us who haven't been in the report. Um, or is it around Stadia? Because, I don't know, I would have thought Taxing Square is full responsibility of, you know, the Istanbul police or Istanbul authorities? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Um, for any UCC event, UEFA has at least some form of, 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 of moral responsibility to address uh, this sort of matter. So people will blame UEFA for whatever happens to them when they travel to a, to a, to a final or to a to, to UEFA club competitions game, and and something goes wrong. Now, when it comes to, when it's a final, UEFA has probably more to say about the way fans are hosted. More and more, the events the event is also taking place in the city. You take the example of, of Istanbul. There will be there will be fan meeting point. There will be a fan village. So that's also something the host city is committed to committed to do to 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 welcome fans in the best possible way. Um, the, the the fact that the report says that uh, UEFA has uh, um, the prime responsibility in what happened in Paris, I mean, it's it's their event, and they have an overarching responsibility to 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 overview uh, everything that is happening. Um, I think in the case of Paris, that problem that means that UEFA should have pulled the trigger, the alarm earlier, when re- when realizing when that uh, the French public authorities were in, incapable of hosting the the event properly. And take it to a polit- to the political level, but again, it's 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 that's where that's not the trickiest. As we've seen in Qatar, as we see at every major event, when the host uh, country, when the host city decides at the last moment to change key elements of the uh, of the organization, the uh, you'll find this case of you find Qatar is uh, is in a weak position because they're not going to take their their tournament or their event in other countries five days before the final. Ronan, thank you very much for joining us on Sport on Lot. Ronan Avain, the Executive Director of Football Supporters Europe and one of those on the commission behind the UEFA review into the Champions League final chaos last year. Well, turning to Barcelona now and perhaps just when things look calmer for the football club, top of La Liga again, despite all the financial turmoil of recent years, having to cut the wage bill, offload players, 
the club's back in the spotlight again under another investigation. This time over, payments to a company linked to one of the senior La Liga refereeing officials. This is sort of echoes of the of the sort of Juventus scandal, of, isn't it? The, the sort of connection with re, with referees. Um, I see Barcelona's their, their sort of main statement on this is expressing sort of unhappiness that it's come out at this point in in their sort of title campaign, which uh, all seems to me is like. It's the wrong approach, really, if you're a club, complaining about the timing of, of this rather than actual, actually addressing the basic points. Yeah, it's incredible, this statement. Um, it's very much in keeping with uh, Jean Laporte, who we'll get to in terms of this payments to the referee. Barcelona re- regrets that this information appeared just at the best sporting moment of the present season. It, it's a remarkable, tinnied statement, to be honest, and it's not going to distract anyone from how big yet another scandal is at Barcelona. It seems like every few months or is it every few weeks there is some new hell that has emerged from from inside Barcelona and and the pay, they're not small payments. Should we go through a little bit of this? It says this this um, former refereeing official. He was a vice president of the referees committee uh, for the Spanish Football Association. His name is Jose Maria Enriquez Negreira, and He'd taken over since 2001 his companies uh, or companies linked to him that's seven million euros um, from from FC Barcelona. It said the payment started under uh, a previous president called Joan Gaspart, and they were about 140 thousand euros in the beginning. Laporta, when he came for his first term around 2003, gets up to. 600,000 euros or about that. And then uh, by the time Jose Maria Bartomeu, that president who was ousted uh, a couple of years ago because of that financial disaster plus a number of other scandals, he got paid 1.6 million euros. Um, it's, it's probably more money than the, this refereeing official had ever earned in his life, but from, from this football club. Um no one, Barcelona said this was for kind of research reports. No, there was no um, efforts to manipulate refereeing choices. But it's a huge amount of money to be paying, you know, a, ref, a refereeing official, isn't it? The Barcelona said the relationship with that supplier extended to technical reports related to professional refereeing in order to complement the information requested by the first and second team coaching staff. This is a common practice among professional football clubs. These kinds of outsource services are now the duty of a professional who works for the football department. And then they complain about how the information has been released and just when it's been released. How kind of Barcelona to do that? Very kind of them. I, I was thinking, though, how the mighty have fallen. I mean, if you think back a decade or more to the Barcelona's reputation, you know, this club owned by the fans, had a shirt sponsored by UNICEF. And now they're sort of, I mean, not so much has come out, you know, state, uh, illegal state support, a whole raft of thing, all the financial stuff that they've been doing. I mean, really, it's, uh, yeah, that the, the club which could do no wrong now can do no right. Yeah, yeah. well, it's the slogan, more, more than a club. Is that right? Mescom club. I mean, you're right. In terms of, again, this could be a case study for for um, students in terms of how to, like, this was, as you said, a very pristine brand, something other teams were aspiring to, you know. And now they've got this financial crisis. They have to attract, I guess, a lot of sponsorship and a lot of new money. I don't know, in terms of the brand being tarnished, do you think it makes an impact or is, is having the best players on the pitch enough? Well, if there's any sort of punishment that was detrimental to that, then of course there could be an impact on the pitch. But for many of their supporters, seeing them back at the top of La Liga on course to win the title should be enough. To Olympic matters now and the ongoing row of the IOC seeming determination to allow Russians and Belarusians to compete at 
the Paris 2024 Games as neutrals, despite so, backlash yeah, we've had another from so many countries. From Thomas and this Park, week, the, the news of president about some correspondence the from the IOC saying he shares to sort of the grief and suffering of Ukrainian athletes, plan. but insisting it's not up to individual governments to decide who takes part in sport. Um, this is, a, you know, the, the IOC's ongoing and efforts to persuade the, the world to allow the Russians and the Belarusians back into international competition. We're still waiting, Martin, for, for that letter, aren't we, from um, the 36 or so governments that met um, last week to, to discuss what potential joint action could be taken. It seems like the positions are really entrenched. You've read another kind of statement there from Thomas Burke. Um, what what do you what do you anticipate this letter to look like? It's gonna it's gonna it's so many countries together. It won't, you can't imagine it being as strong as I guess the uh, the, um, the comments obviously from the Ukrainians, but even from the, the the British sports minister after the meeting. It's probably going to be something a bit more consensual. I don't know. There's not going to be call for a boycott. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think they will, they will be trying to put pressure on the IOC instead. But, I mean, I think the IOC, the way they can um, look, deal with this is that they they know that National Olympic Committees will be far more reluctant to boycott than governments. So the British Olympic Association, for example, will almost certainly not boycott the Paris Olympics just because the Russians and the Belarusians will be taking part as neutrals. I think that's um, that's a given. They didn't in Moscow um, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, so they're probably not going to now. Um, other countries might, and I think that is the big fear for Thomas Park. So not only Ukraine, but Poland, uh, other Ukrainian neighbours. Yeah, the Baltic nations they, seem yeah. quite aligned on, on, on this. But even one, even one boycott would be, a sla- you know, too much really for, for for the position Thomas Bach is in here, right? Especially if it's Ukraine, the country that has been invaded, sending no athletes, while the invading force has hundreds of athletes at the Paris Olympics. That that is not going to be a good look for for the IOC, is it? I don't quite understand though why. As we, I think we've discussed this before, but if it, a year ago. Um, nearly a year ago, after the invasion um, at the end of February last year of Ukraine, and, and then the IOC took this decision to ban Russians and, or to recommend that Russians and Belarusians don't take part in international competition because of a breach of the Olympic truce. Um, nothing has changed. So why? Why is what is the reason? For Thomas Bach and the IOC to take this fight on, why, why, why not just keep going with it? With the, ex- the yeah, it's exa- the exclusion? exactly the point, and we kind of a bit of a stuck record on this every week. That's the the question that I think we, we we've said, and and um, if 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 we were to be in a situation, we could ask a question that would obviously be the question because look, we are a year in, uh, the, the bodies are piling up, Ukrainian cities of. Some of them have been turned to dust. A lot of um, human uh, tragedy in, in, in Ukraine as a result of, of Russia's actions, more, more so in the year since, obviously, that they're not showing any signs of scaling back. So, yeah. And yes, obviously, this man is running a sporting event. And then you get to the practicalities of his qualification competitions beginning to send athletes to the Olympics and... And is it something as prosaic and maybe as cynical as banning them when it didn't count, but trying to loosen those restrictions now now it does count? I don't know, but it'd be nice to have a chance to ask those questions in a in a, in a setting where we can. I, I just don't think we've ever we've had another chance. I don't think since since that time. No, you're right. It's another one of those. Um... Presidents of international sporting organisations trying to limit very much the the, the amount of um, opportunities that the media get to actually ask them some quite difficult questions. A situation there in China, the the Chinese 
Football Association president has been detained amid allegations of bribery and embezzlement and, and corruption. And he's probably, we won't be hearing from, from, from him again. Uh, this is this is China that 2015, 2016 seemed to be like on the up and up when it came to football. This is where FIFA was looking, where fo- European football was looking for all its new money. And another sign that things might not be, um, well, clearly not going the way they look to be going just a few years ago. Yeah, this is Chen Xu Huan. Um, he's also, though, the Deputy Party Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's not just the, um, the President of the Chinese Football Federation. So, um, and yes, he's been taken to custody for suspected violations of CCP discipline and laws. So, um, yeah, it uh, looks pretty serious for Chinese football. And I think other officials have been arrested as well there, haven't they, other Chinese Yeah, officials? including... Um... The former Everton player Lee Tie, he he he's in that bit between being arrested and being detained. Um, but this was some months ago. He was the former Chinese national team coach. He got detained very publicly um, a few months ago. Again, similar kind of charges related to graft, and and now he's gone. The 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 FA president you mentioned there was also the chairman of Shanghai Ports. Uh, they ended up creating and owning one of the biggest spending teams in in the CSL, Shanghai SIPG. They bought Oscar from Chelsea for 60 million, Hulk, the Brazilian, spent a load of money. And and then this guy um, moved on to the Chinese FA. It just seems like that big plan seems to be unravelling there. I know it really is. I mean, just a a sort of local example in England um, about... The is West Bromwich Albion, um, bought by a Chinese company. Uh, the owner is a Guachan Lai, um, I think for just over 200 million pounds. Um, and now he uh, is in a situation where he, he borrowed five million pounds from the club a couple of years ago to shore up one of his other companies, um, in based in Hong Kong, promised to repay the money and has now missed. Um, two, if not three, deadlines, I think. And he said he's going to repay it early in the new year, whenever that means. I mean, this is, it's not a huge amount of money, £5 million, but it just shows that if the Chinese authorities are not willing to um, allow this propping up of, of, of football anymore, then it's uh, what's going to happen. And, you know, the bubble, the Chinese bubble has completely burst. Speaking of bubbles bursting or, or or opportunities here, depends which way you look at it. DAZN, Martin, a company now that has lost $5 billion in the last three or four years. It's a huge amount of money on its bet on sports TV rights. This is a um, sports television network, right? I mean, it was going to be a streamer, but I think it's more than that. It's on, it's on um, cable TV in some countries. It has these offerings. Um, that differ territory to territory. Um, Five billion dollars, Martin. You spoke to its latest chief executive, did you, Shay uh, Segev? Yeah, well, yeah. No, I had a, had a, had a, a, a lengthy sit down with him. Um, he was, had some interesting things to say. Um, very bullish, as you might think he might be. Um, and you're right. The most recent results of the, the losses. In 2021, were 1.4 billion. He says they're going to they're going to um, break even. That they basically had to put a, a lot of money into setting it up. It's a sort of a really truly global business, isn't it? I mean, it isn't it? It's just about every country. Um, so yeah, it's, but it you know the, the the key thing is to try and get people to uh, to sign up to it, and I suppose that's the the task all these streaming platforms have to do. So he was talking. Um, quite strongly, is it a high priority to get Premier League rights in the UK, for example, domestic rights? Or they already they already have some of the international rights. They've got they've just done a ten year deal with the NFL. He wants the Premier League to and British authorities to um, move away from the model of a three year deal. Does, he wants to, to scrap the Saturday three pm blackout. Thinks that's a sort of missed opportunity. Um, 
and I think it was talking about doing a sort of pay per view model in the future as well. So you know, you don't just you may not just sign up for a, every month, but you you know you can just click on a match on your app and then pay the whatever it is fee and, and watch it. So these are quite fundamental changes. Obviously, changes that would suit a company like DAZN. So this has always been my kind of question about their model. Without a ten-year license to something like the Premier League, it, it is very weak in terms of what what it looks like, medium to long term. Because right cycles are three-year cycles, aren't they? Or four-year cycles domestically in in many countries. Now, if he's building this 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 platform, the the viewers or subscribers, whatever word you want to use for, for people who want to watch football on the telly, they will just go wherever the football is. So he, this company is always at the whim of whatever rights they have at any one time. There isn't, there isn't this other um, mass offering they have. They don't have like films or, or, or television programs. They don't sell broadband services. They don't sell mobile phone services. This is just a, a sports network that you will pay to watch your your league if they don't have it you'll just go somewhere else and i I, i've always struggled with this idea of how they're going to compete in in that bigger marketplace with bigger companies that have other offerings and to me five billion dollar bet is is enormous even though their owner len blavatnik is is one of the richest men in the world it certainly sort of convinced me that they that they have a model which could work um uh, I mean, interestingly, in Italy, obviously, they've got the Serie A domestic rights. Um, and so I did ask, because they have a sort of lin- a linear um, offering there as well. So, you know, the old-fashioned TV, because they, they initially they had some technical problems. The, you know, the broadband in Italy wasn't as developed as it, as it should be. So I think there were people struggling to actually stream it properly initially. I think he says those those problems have been ironed out, but actually, people watch it much much more on the digital app than they do on on the linear version. So, before we go, there's something that I found uh, caught my eye this week, Martin. It was uh, another podcast. It was um, Alistair Campbell, former communications director for the Tony Blair government here in the UK. He's 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 got a, a podcast leading. Um, and he interviews influential people. He had Michael Johnson, the great American athlete, uh, one time the world record holder in both the 200 and 400 metres, um, and he's become um, a broadcaster with the BBC himself, an entrepreneur businessman. And it, it was a very interesting interview, but one of the things that struck me was he was very critical of the world athletics president, Seb Co. Um, in general, um, he he praised him for his hard stance on Russia, but he said he hasn't really done much in the years he's been leading world athletics for the sport itself. He said, it, it, he said, um, basically, this is his quote. He spent a lot of time making sure he looks good, uh, but the sport isn't really doing well commercially athletes apart from one or two at the very top are struggling to make ends meet um nothing's really happened um he was saying that maybe it's a governing body not an events company maybe it should sell its commercial rights to someone who can do something with athletics it was it was quite pointed criticism and you know you guys were talking last week about co potentially being the next ioc president well, I mean, I think it's right. Athletics is struggling, isn't it, to sort of win eyeballs. Um, I mean, I think Coe's done a really, really good job on the drugs, tackling drugs front. I mean, the, it's not just Russia. Oh, lots and lots of Kenyans have been have been caught by the Athletics Integrity Unit. Um, I don't think any other sport has addressed it in such a way as athletics has. But, yeah, on the other side of the, the coin, um, getting... Money, TV deals, sponsorship, attracting people to watch athletics. It, it's, I think it's a, it's a tall order. I don't know how you do it. Um, well, well maybe it? like it's been seven, eight years. Maybe they don't know how to do it. And, and maybe Johnson's point that 
you're a governing body and the points you raise there, Martin, that the, the kind of gold stars are for governance. And that's a separate arm, isn't it? Like anti-doping, brilliant work. They've got the that integrity unit, the independent one um, run by Brett Clothier um, and and the, the stance on Russia. Those are governance matters. But you also are running and trying to grow a, a sport. And that's the bit that hasn't really moved. And I, that, the other quote um, it's quite feels quite personal. I don't know what the relationship between the two men is, but it said uh, some of the rhetoric gets a little pat ourselves on the back for what we've done. <laughs> Welcome to the world of international sport, Michael. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>